Good evening, everyone. I am Mark Bloom, and I have the honor to, to serve as chair of the American College of Bankruptcy. And as soon as I take this off, you'll be able to see that my lips are really moving, and I'm about to speak to you. Tonight, we celebrate coming together once again in person, vaccinated, socially distanced, and mask mandated, with fist or elbow bumps in lieu of handshakes and hugs, but in person nonetheless for the two most joyous moments of this or any other year in the college, the induction of our new fellows and the presentation of our distinguished service award. It's difficult for me to believe that it's been two full years since we last were together in person in October of 2019 back in Washington, DC. So long ago that I confess I had to go back to my files to confirm the date and location of that meeting. In the interim, we were forced to turn to virtual format for our last three meetings, March of 2020 and 21, that were scheduled again for Washington, and October of 2020 for San Diego. Yeah, that one really hurt. So we conducted our meetings virtually, just as all of us have been forced to conduct so much of our business and even our personal communications in virtual format. I know that for all too many, the COVID pandemic has caused great personal hardship and loss and offer the hope that through continued caution, determination and adherence to health and safety guidelines, we all will make it through to a safe and healthy, brighter day that cannot come soon enough. And so on behalf of the American College of Bankruptcy and our president, Melissa Kibler, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the Indiana State Museum for this very special evening at which we will honor some very special people. Almost 50 new inductees who were able to travel here tonight and be with us in person, and one very special United States bankruptcy judge, the Honorable Barbara J. Hauser, whose long and meritorious service to the bench, bar, community, profession, and so many organizations, including the college itself, make her the recipient of the college's highest honor. I have the privilege to introduce to you the presenter of our 2021 Distinguished Service Award. The Honorable Thomas L. Ambro, judge of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, is by no means a stranger to the college. Inducted as a fellow back in class seven, while practicing as a preeminent bankruptcy lawyer in a small town called Wilmington, Delaware, tonight is the third time that Judge Ambro has graced our stage for the portion of the program at which we present our most prestigious award. In 2019, he presented the award to another revered recipient, D. Jan Baker. In 2017, Jan presented the award to him. Judge Ambro, you're becoming a most welcome fixture at these presentations. We truly appreciate your continuing involvement in the college and we are so much the better for it. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Thomas L. Ambro. Colleagues, college inductees, ladies and gentlemen, friends, and family of Barbara Hauser. It is a privilege to be with you tonight. It is where we can collectively assemble and acknowledge the truth that Article I judges are no less important than their Article III cousins. <laughs> Watching almost anyone do almost anything well is a great good. Seeing someone perform at the top of her craft is special. Barbara Hauser is special. Whether sitting first chair in Chapter 11's as a judge in command of every nuance in a bankruptcy case, and hence expecting you to be as prepared as she, whether serving as a named plaintiff heading the charge for bankruptcy judges' pay, 
whether in her most recent challenge as the lead mediator in the Puerto Rico insolvencies. Barbara is a professional in full. Fully in command, fully understanding the issues and the players, fully willing to thread new ideas with the old, and when appropriate, to commit to them and carry them through. I focused on where I have observed Barbara most closely and personally, the Puerto Rico cases that by my recollection are among the three largest in American history. You had not only the Commonwealth with its initially 3.3 million people, though now much less, but also its several instrumentalities ranging from a special purpose entity known as COFINA to its aqueduct and sewer authority and numerous others. Their reorganization is under a unique insolvency law that, while it borrows much from the bankruptcy code, contains many provisions and constructs that are unique to the Commonwealth entities. In the late spring of 2017, Barbara came new to these insolvencies containing disputes that had been brewing literally for decades. She was the lead mediator on a team where, to my knowledge, only one of its mediators, Judge Nancy Atlas, had significant experience in mediation. I was on the team and I had next to no experience. Nearly every initial estimate we made was in hindsight woefully understated. Just asking the parties to identify issues resulted in a deluge of binders, I repeat, binders, in which teams of talented attorneys attempted to issue spot as they had never done since law school. Needless to say, our initial projection of a two-year project looks now as surpassing strange. In the course of our over four years to date, there were bravura highs, for example, mediating the plan of adjustment for COFINA in only a year, followed by, as night the day, desperate lows of near despair. There were many creditors and others swimming in the distrusting currents of their colleagues who seemed never to ask what were the concerns of the other side. Mistrust and suspicion are expected but not expected were the non-legal setbacks that came like clockwork. Here I quote another member of the mediation team, Judge Robbie Colton, quote, when asked about Barbara's mediation work, I struggled to find a way to express the enormity of the Puerto Rico experience without disclosing anything from the mediation. I wish I saved it, but it was something like this. In 2017, Barbara had a strategy, started work, and then Hurricane Maria showed up to blow it all away. In 2018, she had a new strategy. She started work and civil unrest came along and toppled the government. In 2019, she had a strategy. She started work and then came waves of earthquake after earthquake. In 2020, she had yet another strategy, and the Commonwealth even filed a plan of adjustment. And of course, the pandemic came and wiped out all that work. And just this year, before the beginning of the change of the U.S. administrations, she developed yet another strategy, but President Trump decided that it was very important to shake up the composition of the Puerto Rico Oversight Board as he skipped out of the White House. Close quote. So what happened? Barbara, after all those false starts and Sisyphean slides, cut the trail and the rest followed. Reluctantly, then tepidly, then slowly, but ending with breakthroughs based on trust. And why so? I offer the following thoughts in the look back. One, Barbara was prepared. No less so than any 
professional in the resolution process. And unlike those professionals, she worked in effect for free. Without any exaggeration, I believe that Barbara has spent at least 10,000 hours in the nearly four and a half years to date of the Puerto Rico insolvencies. Indeed, I can think of no item so small as not to attract her attention and her focus. Two, she countered complexities with damn right ideas that were flashcards simple to understand. I cannot tell you how important that is. Three, for a judge, some said, did not listen as often as she quickly jumped to the conclusion ahead of counsel. I've, always, I've often said to Barbara, it's like going from first to third across pitcher's mound. Barbara became in mediation so patient a listener. All right, most of the time. <laughs> you might have mistaken her for a psychotherapist. She spoke with everyone of every station from the governor to the Commonwealth's pensioners. Four, to the seemingly endless and often repetitious complaints of suspicion, mistrust, and motifs of contempt never fully explained, Barbara's responses were thoughtful, measured, and practical. She did so with no malice, no sentimentality, and no excuses. Five, the upshot. Barbara Hauser became the most trusted person in the Puerto Rico bankruptcies. She kept the plate spinning as she set the table for a settlement. A slow crawl through the dark emerged with a consensus no one of us at times imagined. During the course of the myriad mediation sessions, Barbara often exclaimed, I just want to finish this before I'm in a retirement home. My response, don't even think about it, baby. You have too much talent and so much more to give. In the meantime, come forward to accept this most merited recognition, the American College of Bankruptcy's Distinguished Service Award. Thank you all very much, um, uh, and good evening, uh, both to those of you who are here with us tonight in person, thankfully, uh, and those who are watching uh, tonight's events virtually. Uh, I know that the virtual process is always a challenge, so my fingers are crossed that that's working for all of your family members who weren't able to be here with you tonight, along with some of mine and some friends. Um, I want to say to Judge Ambrose, um, thank you for such a wonderful introduction. If you ever decide to leave your current circuit judge gig, perhaps you could consider fiction writing as you have quite the gift of embellishment. Um, uh, the simple truth is, is Puerto Rico has been an enormous challenge, but I have four judicial colleagues uh, without whom I could not have done uh, what has been done. Um, and the biggest worry I had tonight was that Judge Ambrose was going to tell you that when I called him and asked him to join the mediation team, you know, he sort of said, well, you know, kind of how long do you think this is gonna take? I said, oh, we'll get this done in a couple of years, Tom. Um, and unfortunately, it was my prediction that proved to be inevitably quite wrong. Uh, but Judge Ambrose has worked tirelessly uh, with the team, as has Judge Nancy Atlas, uh, Judge Victor Marrero from the Southern District of New York, uh, and then Judge Robbie Colton, uh, who is a college fellow uh, and who hopefully is watching us virtually tonight. 
So my big thanks to them because kudos go to them. Uh, this, this was inevitably a team effort, not a single effort. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the college and its leadership, Mark, Melissa, others. Um, I am truly honored to have been chosen as this year's recipient of the Distinguished Service Award. Being recognized by your peers is high praise. For me, tonight is about three things. First, reflecting on the many years that I have been fortunate enough to be a part of this insolvency community. Second, thanking all that have shown me the way. And third, expressing the hope that I feel for the future of our practice area. First reflections. When Lisa, now Judge Beckerman, called me with the news that I had been selected to receive this year's Distinguished Service Award, I was surprised. My immediate reaction was to think that she dialed the wrong number. As I felt there were any number of college fellows who could have been chosen in my stead. I then wondered how I had gotten so old, as awards like this usually do not come to youngsters. But over the course of the next day or so, it became clear to me that if I am deserving of this award, it is because of the people in my life who guided me to become the person that I am and who helped shape the lawyer and judge I became. After all, lawyer is an intense people-oriented business, whether those people are clients, colleagues, or adversaries. And of course, reflections cannot, or perhaps should not, be had tonight without including the impact the coronavirus has had on so many throughout the world over the last 18 months or so. I'm sure those of us who are here tonight are grateful for our health and the opportunity to be together again. Others have not been so fortunate. I ask that we take a moment of silence as we remember friends, family members, and others who have been lost to the virus or continue to struggle to retain good health. Thank you. My thank you list tonight is quite lengthy, although I will try and be brief, and starts with my parents who died in the mid-1990s, but who would be, as my brother said at my judicial investiture, so proud tonight. To say that my parents shaped my brother and me is a significant understatement. Neither of my parents completed college, but it was clear to Mark and me that we certainly would, along with pro professional schools if we so chose, from a relatively early age. When I was born, my dad was a fertilizer salesman in a small rural farming community in western Nebraska, and my mom was a stay-at-home mother. My parents wanted more for our family, so after years of my dad talking about that he would like to buy a small business where he could be his own boss, an opportunity presented itself when he was 40. My folks took all the money they had, which wasn't a whole lot, along with a little money that they were able to borrow from my dad's father. And they bought a small business my dad knew nothing about in another small town, this time in the middle of Nebraska. Although buying this business was risky for our family, through hard work and dedication, my parents working together in the business made it a success. My brother and I worked in the business summers and on weekends during school. But by watching my parents work together to achieve their goals for our family, I learned that hard work and dedication pay off. In short, I learned that you can be whatever you want to be with hard work, some skill, and a healthy dose of good luck. But as we all know, the harder you work honing your skills, the luckier you seem to get. 
When I decided to go to law school, I really didn't have an idea of what being a lawyer would be like. The only lawyer I knew was a small town lawyer in my hometown. But I worked hard in law school and got hired by one of the best and oldest law firms in Dallas, the Locke Purnell Law Firm, now known to many of you as Locke Lord after several iterations, um, following law school. When I started at the firm, I wanted to be a litigator, not a bankruptcy lawyer. Who knew anything about bankruptcy? But as luck would have it, the litigation partner assigned to be my mentor, Larry Lesh, dabbled in bankruptcy, because that's what most big firms had. They had bankruptcy dabblers at the time. Uh, and he asked me to help him with some of his bankruptcy cases. I did, and I quickly realized that I would get more litigation experience as a bankruptcy lawyer than as a big firm young litigation associate sitting third or fourth or fifth chair on big complex litigation matters. And then I found I loved the bankruptcy code and all that it embodies, the fresh start to which the honest but unfortunate debtor is entitled, whether that debtor be an individual or a major business entity that has fallen on hard times. No more Dickens debtor prisons. The ability to successfully reorganize a company, save jobs, and return the business to productivity, or to allow an individual debtor to discharge her pre-petition debts and thus get a fresh start is a remarkable experience. Who among us hasn't needed a second chance at something over the years? And of course, this practice area is like a good game of three-dimensional chess, anticipating the moves of many constituencies, recognizing the shifting alliances from issue to issue, and leading, or perhaps I should say hurting, clients and adversaries to business solutions that make sense for all, each of which demands much skill and finesse. So for me, the decision to switch practice areas from litigation to bankruptcy was easy when Locke Purnell established a formal bankruptcy section and retiring bankruptcy judge John Flowers was hired to lead the section. As my experience and reputation grew, I came to the attention of a well-known bankruptcy lawyer and fellow college fellow from Houston, Mickey Scheinfeld who approached me and asked me to join his insolvency-focused law firm, Scheinfeld, Maley & Kay, as the partner in charge of the Dallas office of the firm. After some agonizing, because I was really happy at Locke Purnell, I decided to accept Mickey's offer and make the change in what turned out to be one of the best decisions of my legal career. Both Mickey and another named partner, Joel Kay, our college fellows who became dear friends and mentors to me over the years. I owe them much. And to my good fortune, almost all of the past recipients of this award either inspired me or were mentors to me over the years. And it is an unbelievable honor to join their ranks tonight. While singling out any individual is risky, for fear of offending another, I want to acknowledge in particular a handful of past recipients of this award. Professor Larry King, who was kind enough to come to Dallas and speak at my judicial investiture to my great delight. Leon Foreman, Jerry Smith, Barney Shapiro, Leonard Rosen, Harvey Miller, Ron Trost, Alan Resnick, whose son is being inducted tonight, and Jay Westbrook. I learned much from listening to them talk at college meetings, meetings of the National Bankruptcy Conference, client meetings, or informal dinners. I also had the pleasure of working closely with and becoming good friends with other past award recipients, including Ken Klee, Rich Levin, and Jan Baker. I'm grateful to each of them for what I learned from them 
and the impact they had on my professional career. I also had the privilege of appearing in front of or working with a number of wonderful judges. Bankruptcy, thank you, Tom, for the comment about Article I versus Article III judges. District and circuit judges. When I became a bankruptcy judge in the Northern District of Texas, I aspired to be like the best of them, if possible. They include the likes of judges Carolyn King, Pat Higginbotham, and Tom Ambro. Bankruptcy judges Bob Ginsburg, Bob Martin, Mary Scott, Tom Small, Bert Lifflin, and of course Liz Paris. Most anything that I have done well, I borrowed from their playbooks, and of course my mistakes were all my own. Finally, I would like to thank my brother, who has always been a great supporter of my career for his love and friendship over the years. And of course, my wife, Sarah, who is the charter member of the Barbara Hauser Fan Club. While Sarah and I just met a few years ago and married last year, I have often wondered what my life and career might have been like if only we had met sooner and I had had her love and support throughout my career. Little known fact, today is Sarah's birthday, so please wish her a happy birthday. All right, hope. I only have to look at the resumes of the two classes of fellows being inducted into the college tonight to know that the future of my chosen profession and field of law are in good hands. Individually, you are all so talented and dedicated. Collectively, you inspire me and others to be better than we currently are. And candidly, you make me glad I was admitted into the college years ago when the standards much, must have been much lower. I expect your selection as a college fellow similarly caused you to reflect on all that you have done in order to be invited to become a college fellow and all that you will continue to do for the betterment of our insolvency community and our broader communities. I also expect that, like me, you recognize that you succeeded because those who went before you lent you a helping hand. Thank them, please, and tell them what they mean to you. If we have learned anything from the past 18 months, we know that we cannot take anything for granted. Finally, I ask that you continue to instill hope in others and inspire them to be better than they are. This is particularly important now as we continue to work remotely and our younger colleagues do not have the same opportunities to physically be present in the room with their seniors and mentors as each of us did. In this people-oriented business of ours, I cannot emphasize how important being in the room or at the conference table or dinner table was for my career development, and I assume yours as well. And yes, our mente mentees can still be in the Zoom room with us, but it's different. And time will tell of the longer term career impact our younger colleagues will experience. But if each of us remains cognizant of the importance of mentoring those around us in whatever way we can, I trust that their careers will be as fulfilling as each of ours has been. Tonight is a wonderful night in celebration of your many accomplishment. I know your families are proud of you, as are all of your new college fellow colleagues. Work hard to continue to earn their love and support of all that you do. Thank you all. I am truly grateful to be here with you tonight.
Congratulations, Judge Hauser. As you look back at the list of prior recipients of the, the award, so many of whom you were gracious enough to name tonight, I know that you're honored to be among those luminaries and that they too are honored to be joined by you. And now for the induction ceremony. This year's induction ceremony offers two brand new, never before, first time features for the college. For the first time, we're inducting not one, but two new classes of fellows on the same evening. We all have learned how to accomplish a great deal, a great many things remotely since we last were together in 2019. But there never really was any question that even if we had to wait more than a year, we wanted to greet and congratulate and induct our new fellows live and in person. Also for the first time, we've dispensed with the requirement of black tie formal attire for inductees and speakers here on the stage. Now, depending on one's perspective, this deviation from past practice may be a source of disappointment or relief. I suspect it's a bit of a disappointment to the incoming Class 31 fellow, who will remain nameless for tonight, who told us that he had just brought home his brand new tuxedo that weekend in March 2020, only to be greeted by the email saying that reluctantly we were canceling the in-person portion and induction ceremony of our 2020 Washington, D.C. program. And so, as this new fellow tells it, uh, to relieve his disappointment over the postponement, he immediately dressed up in his tuxedo and took his dog out for an evening walk in the neighborhood. <laughs> Tonight, that fellow sits somewhere in one of the Class 31 rows here, presumably without the tuxedo and hopefully without the dog. I confess that the change in dress code comes as something of a relief for me. Even more that I confess I exercise the prerogative of the chair to set aside the formal attire requirement for this evening based on my own induction experience in class nine, 23 and a half years ago. Taking no chances with my brand new, bought, not rented tuxedo, second one I ever owned. Hey, this one was even black, it was beautiful. I didn't fold and pack it in my luggage, but instead I zipped it carefully into a separate garment bag to hang in the closet of my flight to Washington, D.C., the morning of the induction ceremony. And of course, you can guess what happened next. I left it behind, twice. Once at home in Miami, from where I managed desperately to have a messenger service sent to my home and bring it to me at the airport in time to make the flight, and then unbelievably, then again on the plane in Washington, D.C., not realizing it until I got to the hotel to register and look for that garment bag. While I was fortunate enough that the plane was still on the ground and the people from the airport lounge were nice enough to retrieve it and hold it for me. So having protected our new inductees from any risk of a similar wardrobe fiasco, I offered to them and to their families and guests some of the many reasons why they are here tonight. You are here tonight to join the leaders and the achievers of this bankruptcy and insolvency profession in this honorary association that offers membership only to a limited few on a highly selective basis after a rigorous selection process through your judicial circuit or a special nominating committee. You are here tonight having made your way through that process because in the judgment of your peers, you have distinguished yourself through sustained excellence in your career as a professional over a period of not less than 15 years and an insolvency professional for not less than 10 of those years. You are here tonight because in addition to your considerable talents as a lawyer, trustee, financial advisor, academic or judge, you have given back to the profession and to your communities through noteworthy and important contributions to education, civic and charitable endeavors, and pro bono service, and to the betterment of our profession. You are here because in fulfilling these rigid criteria for membership in the college, you have demonstrated yourself to be of the highest moral and ethical character 
in your dealings with other members of the profession and the communities you serve. You are here because your families, spouses, partners, significant others, children, parents, have supported you in your careers, making the sacrifices that all too often have included missed dinners, missed family events, deferred expenses, and in some cases, even missed cherished vacations. And most important of all, you are here not to cap your careers, but to enhance them, to gain privileged access to a new medium, a new vehicle, through which to maintain your professional excellence and adherence to the highest goals of the profession, and hopefully to find within your busy schedules the time to devote a portion of the talent for which you're being recognized tonight to the service of an organization that seeks out only the best and the brightest. And so your peers within your circuits, they found you. We got you. We honor and induct you tonight. And then we're not done with you yet because we will ask more of you to advance the goals and mission of the college, including the goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our firms, in our communities, and in the profession as a whole. As you ponder the significance of this evening for your lives and careers, I ask you to consider that no other segment of the legal, business, and financial community has kept the wheels of justice turning, has solved the great and small problems of so many people, and helped to save so many companies and jobs through 18 months of a global pandemic as the bankruptcy community to which we recognize your career contributions by inducting you as a fellow of this special organization tonight. The work that we in the insolvency profession do from the smallest case providing a fresh start to an individual or local business to the largest national and multinational case advising and assisting hundreds or thousands of stakeholders is important not just to those stakeholders, not just to commerce, but to society as a whole. And you are here tonight because you distinguish yourself as an elite member of that profession. And now to proceed with the ceremony, I introduce to you the chair of the College Board of Regents, Charlie Beckham, to offer a few words about the members of the classes, which the, after which the president of the college, Melissa Kibler, We'll call the names of inductees first in class 31 and then in class 32 to come forward for induction. Charlie? Thank you, Mark. And good evening, everyone. I'm Charlie Beckham. I'm the chair of the Board of Regents of the college. Uh, it is the Board of Regents that elects college okay it is the job of the board of regents to elect the new fellows of the college and it's my pleasure to formally welcome the new fellows from class 31 and class 32 uh, i would be remiss if i didn't tell everyone that i was the chair for the board of regents for the election of class 32 our colleague Stephen Lerner uh, was the chair of the Board of Regents for Class 31, but is unfortunately not able to be here this evening. I'm equally delighted to welcome and thank many of the relatives, friends, and colleagues of our newest fellows to this evening's induction ceremony. We gather tonight to honor the exceptionally, an exceptionally talented group of bankruptcy professionals from throughout the U.S. and the world. Uh, each of you has devoted countless hours to professional, in uh, professional endeavors throughout your career. Your professional successes and achievements uh, have come at uh, significant personal demands, uh, and many of you have missed birthdays, celebrations, school plays, soccer games, piano recitals, and interrupted or canceled vacations. My wife is here and I apologize to her, uh, at, uh, as many of you have done many times. Uh, the clients and colleagues expect, why is that? It's because clients and colleagues expect you to be available 24-7 and by your arrival here to, for the induction, 
you have demonstrated that you have never let any client or colleague down with respect to your professional endeavors. You probably spend as much time on your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your computer as you do with your family and friends. That's remarkable. And your loved ones have participated in those sacrifices. And so it's really special that so many of you can have your loved ones here to celebrate uh, this uh, event with you tonight. And I wanna thank all of the family and friends for uh, your uh, strident support of the new fellows. They're really remarkable. And they're an elite group, the best and the brightest in the legal profession. Uh, and uh, judges and academics and also financial professionals. They're just a great group of people. I'm gonna lead, read some of the descriptions that are contained in the nomination form for this group of people to let you know uh, how their colleagues think of them. Tremendously well-liked, star of his legal generation, highly ethical, tremendous gifts, consummate professional, technically superb, acts without drama, preeminent academic, modest, unselfish, dedicated public servant, paragon of civility and genius. Uh, and I'm just talking about one of them. So, <laughs> he, uh, to become a fellow uh, is a, uh, the election process generally starts in March of the year. So it started in March of 2019 and 2020 uh, for the two classes. And the process is conducted by in secret without any of the nominees knowing that they're being considered for election to the college. The process requires three fellows from the college to put together an extensive nomination form uh, describing the professional's uh, in expertise, uh, work, and also uh, their writing activities, their honors and awards and community, community service. Then letters of support are solicited from other fellows and it takes a lot to get a, this number of people to come together to put these nominations to, uh, in place. I estimate that it probably takes about 100 hours of non-billable time to put together a proper nomination form. And usually for all of these classes, we have uh, at least 150 to 200 people who at some point in time see the nomination form or are involved in that process. It's truly amazing how many people are involved in the election of new fellows. Now, one of the things is that makes the class of fellows so special is not that they have all done outstanding legal work. That's the bottom, that's the, the floor uh, for how you get here. The, uh, in the nomination form, there's what's called part B, which talks about scholarly activities, community service, and what I like to call being a good person. And uh, it's not that you know that it's true, it's that your colleagues out there have looked at it, observed it, and thought, gee, shouldn't so-and-so be in the college? And uh, you're here tonight, and that is true, uh, true recognition of uh, your accomplishments and what you've done for the profession. The final step in the process after the nomination forms are submitted uh, and vetted by different circuit councils is the election process by the Board of Regents. For class 33, we will have the Board of Regents meeting tomorrow, but last year for class 32, uh, we had an all day marathon meeting to elect class 32 and class 31 had a similar experience as well. Uh, it's a long process, but it is worth the wait, and it's uh, certainly the college welcomes all of you uh, to, in, to become new fellows. Uh, 
generally a couple of things about the classes. Uh, about 30% of the uh, new inductees in the college from 30, class 31 and 32 are women. Uh, that's an improvement over what it has been in the past, but as one of my friends, Becky Roof, has told me that 30% oh, is not enough, quoting uh, Justice Ginsburg, when it's 100% of women, then we'll be okay. So, uh, we, uh, uh, quoting again from Prime Minister Abe of Japan, who once remarked, I often say to entrepreneurs, if Lehman Brothers were Lehman Brothers and Sisters, it would have never gone into bankruptcy. It, uh, it is a true pleasure uh, to have you here. Uh, it's a true recognition of all of your professional accomplishments, all of your service to the bankruptcy community and the community at large. And uh, with that, I will conclude my remarks and we can begin the party of uh, electing you into the college. Melissa? Thank you, Charlie. Uh, good evening. I'm Melissa Kibler, president of the college. I am so honored to be standing in front of all of you today and to be able to participate in tonight's ceremony and to honor this austere group of professionals. I will read each of the inductees' name as they walk across the stage. Please, to the audience, hold your applause until we conclude the induction of the Class 31 Fellows. So I'd like to ask the initial row of inductees to make their way towards the stage. Mary Beth Osbrooks, Nashville, Tennessee. Joyce Bradley Babin, Little Rock, Arkansas. Alan A. Beckett, Malvern, Pennsylvania. Jeffrey E. Bjork, Los Angeles, California. Professor John M. Zarnetsky, Oxford, Mississippi. Christine E. Devine, Worcester, Massachusetts. Dan W. Forker, Jr., Hutchinson, Kansas. The Honorable Catherine J. Fury, Madison, Wisconsin. Adam H. Eisenberg, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. D. Ethan Jeffrey, Boston, Massachusetts. Kevin Lavin, New York, New York. Derek F. Meek, Birmingham, Alabama. Ryan T. Murphy, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dwayne Murray, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Caroline A. Reckler, Chicago, Illinois. Wendell Shirk, St. Louis, Missouri. The Honorable J. Kate Stickles, Wilmington, Delaware. The Honorable Robert R. Summerhays, Lafayette, 
Louisiana. M. Regina Thomas, Atlanta, Georgia. Thomas D. Walker, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Keith H. Wolford, New York, New York. Scott A. Wolfson, Troy, Michigan. This concludes our induction of Class 31. Please show your appreciation to this group of professionals. We will now begin our induction of class 32 if I could ask those individuals to make their way towards the stage. Omar J. Alanis, Dallas, Texas. Paula S. Barron, Richmond, Virginia. Leza F. Blanco, Miami, Florida. Jacob A. Brown, Jacksonville, Florida. Thomas L. Canary, Jr., Louisville, Kentucky. John R. Castellano, Chicago, Illinois. The Honorable Daniel P. Collins, Phoenix, Arizona. Stephen L. Coulomb, Boston, Massachusetts. George A. Davis, New York, New York. Stephanie J. Drew, Denver, Colorado. Janet B. Hagler, Chapin, South Carolina. Eric L. Johnson, Kansas City, Missouri. Jeffrey L. Jonas, Boston, Massachusetts. The Honorable Michael B. Kaplan, Trenton, New Jersey. Jane Kim, San Francisco, California. Teresa C. Cole, West Conshohocken, Pennsylvania. M. Natasha Leibovitz, New York, New York. Adam G. Landis, Wilmington, Delaware. Douglas L. Lutz, Cincinnati, Ohio. Nani Manti, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Ron E. Meisler, Chicago, Illinois. Erica L. Morabito, Washington, D.C. Brian M. Resnick, New York, New York. William J. Rochelle, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Ray C. Schrock, New York, New York. Bradley D. Sharp, Los Angeles, California. 
George H. Singer, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Margaret R. Westbrook, Raleigh, North Carolina. Rhonda J. Winnicor, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This concludes our induction of Class 32. Again, please give the inductees a big round of applause. This evening has been a long time coming. And on behalf of the Board of Directors of the American College of Bankruptcy, congratulations to all of our inductees. It's such an honor to share the stage with you tonight. And thank you to all of the fellows and families and friends who are here, whether in body, mind, or spirit, to share this special night with us. So we will now move to our reception which will be held to my left on the lower and upper terraces. Uh, if you would like to see any of the exhi exhibits in the museum, you may cross over on the upper terrace and enter the exhibits over to my right. You'll be asked to return at approximately 8.15 to be seated for the entree course. Dinner will be open seating. We will have a dessert buffet available to enjoy your leisure after nine o'clock and the museum exhibit galleries are open for your viewing pleasure until 10 o'clock. Thank you very much. This concludes our ceremony. Enjoy the evening.